Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. So nice to see you all here on this wonderful New Orleans day. Um, so how many people here have ever had a moment where you are staring at a blank computer screen, you're trying to solve a problem, you're thinking, I cannot get my head around this, right? We've all had that moment of like, if we just thought a little harder about something, maybe the answer would come to us. Well, as it turns out, thanks to Annie and all of the, the great research that she's encapsulated in her book, there are some other ways to think about thinking. Mm. And that is will be the topic of our discussion today. I think you'll come away from this discussion with some new kind of tips and strategies and habits to adapt that will uh, help you um, use your brain, but also use other external forces, including nature, including your own body, to help your brain be sharper. I think we've always thought in conventional wisdom is, oh, we have to do more crossword puzzles, or we have to do Wordle every morning. By the way, this today is the day of that 1,000th Wordle. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's going to keep our mind sharp, sharp, mm -hmm. sharp. But talk to us about all of these external factors that we can think about to help our brain be sharper. Sure. Thank you, Betsy, for that lovely <laughs> introduction and overview. Um, I should say that I'm um, a journalist who writes about psychology, cognitive science. Um, I'm really interested in people, how people think, how people learn. Um, and that was actually my way into this idea of the extended mind, which I should say is not my idea. It's, a, it's an idea I borrowed from philosophy. Um, I had been um, doing a lot of research and reporting on the science of learning. And this was very much an example of what is called me search uh, because I had two little boys at the time who had just started school. And I was really interested in how they learned, how their teachers were teaching them. And I wanted to understand uh, the science of that. That's, that's always been my mode as a writer is to dive into something that's mm -hmm. really personally compelling and, that, and figure out what the science is behind it. Um, and as I was uh, doing this research and reporting on the science of learning, I kept encountering these really interesting, tantalizing kinds of um, research threads that, that kept, kept challenging my idea about where, literally where learning and thinking happens. Um, all this research on what's known as embodied cognition, the idea that the body plays a big part in, our, in how we think and how we learn. Um, the fact that our the, the spaces that we're in, the physical settings that we're in, really affects the way we think and learn. And finally, the fact that um, our relationships are a huge part of how we think and learn, even though in our very individualistic society, we often think of um, our, our, our thoughts, our learning as happening, you know, sealed inside our skull. But I didn't have a way to pull all those threads together until... I came across a, an article in a, um, a journal article in a philosophy journal called The Extended Mind. Um, it was by two philosophers, Andy Clark and David Chalmers. And this article kind of grabbed me with its very first line, didn't, hasn't let me go. Um, and the first line was, where does the mind stop and the rest of the world begin? And that question really I found very provocative because, uh, well, it would seem to have a, a sort of um, obvious or, or at least conventional answer. You know, I, at the time when I read that, I would have said, well, I guess the mind stops here. You know, it, it's sealed inside the skull. Um, but what Clark and Chalmers were saying was they were saying they were arguing, no, actually, the mind extends uh, out into are the sensations and movements of our bodies, um, the s physical spaces in which we operate, and our relationships to other people. So that to me just um, was a really, as I say, provocative idea, a generative idea, one that um, seemed to have a lot of possibilities for improving the way we think and learn. And it was very personally appealing, but also challenging to me because I'm someone who lives a lot in my head. You know, I've been a reporter, writer, reader for my whole life. And, I, you know, I, I pretty much live inside my head. And so this idea that 
actually so much of what we think and learn, so much of that activity is a process of assembling um, the raw materials that are around us. You know, again, our, our, our bodies, our spaces, our relationships, that those things um, are just as important as the brain itself in our thinking. That was super interesting to me. And then and that set me on the road to writing the book. Yeah, and that path is interesting where you're, you are sort of building out from your body to your spaces, mm -hmm. to other people. Let's just start with the body component mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. um, and talk about some of the issues there, being sort of more in tune with your body. I think anybody that's done yoga or meditation has had sort of the um, you know facilitator talking about doing a body scan yes. as you're laying down yes. on your yoga mat. Um, what all the research have you found out about how to be more in tune with picking up different sort of clues about something by how your body reacts to it? Yes, yeah. So this was super interesting to me. This is what I love about being a journalist is that we're always learning new things. It's like being in school <laughs> for the rest of your life, which for some people doesn't sound so great, but I, I love school. So um, part in in doing the research for this book, I came across a whole body of research um, about something called interoception, which is a big, you know, jargony kind of word. And I, I, I had not heard of it before I started doing the research, but it refers to something that I think we all are familiar with, which is a kind of gut feeling of the, the sensations, the cues, the uh, signals that are flowing through our bodies all the time. Um, but that we often kind of ignore or push aside, right? Um, when we're in that mode that Betsy was talking about where we're staring at that blank computer screen, um, we tend to uh, put the body aside and feel like we've got to power through, use our brain, you know, exhaust our, work our brains until they're exhausted um, and, and not pay attention to the body as much as possible. And what I learned from the research on interoception is that actually these internal cues uh, carry a whole lot of information, a whole lot of experience, a whole lot of wisdom if we tune into them. And the reason for it, I'll just briefly explain because I found this so fascinating. As we make our way through our days, we're taking in such enormous quantities of information, far more than we could ever process consciously because our, our conscious mind is actually only a tiny fraction of, of all the mental activity that's going on at any given moment. Um, and that's that's by design or that's by uh, that's by necessity, I should say, because um, we couldn't actually be consciously aware of all that we're experiencing, all that we're taking in. And yet we are taking that in on on some level, on a non-conscious level. Um, we're, we're noticing patterns. We're um, keeping track of new developments. Um, all that's being all that information is being stored non-consciously. Um, so then you might ask, well, how do we have access to information and experience and knowledge that is stored non-consciously? That's where the body comes in. That's where the little signals that you get from your body are kind of, I like to think of them as like a little tap on the shoulder or a little tug on the sleeve that are saying, pay attention. You've encountered this before. This is something you should pay attention to. And if you're not tuned into your body, then you're not um, taking advantage of all that uh, wisdom and, and knowledge and experience that you have stored. So the body scan that Betsy mentioned is um, researchers have found that that's one of the most effective ways to attune to your interoception, to get in touch with what's going on with your body. Just And what a body scan is, if you haven't experienced it, is um, paying open uh, open-minded, non-judgmental, curious attention to whatever arises in your body. And you don't have to be sitting on a meditation cushion to do that. I actually, um, again, because I do live so much in my body and I'm uh, sorry, in my, in my head, and I'm so often looking at a book or a screen, I try several times throughout the day now to take a moment, mm. take a breath, pay attention to what's going on inside because there's, so, uh, you may feel this as well. There's so much grabbing for our attention in the outside world. And it's so easy to have your, your attention seized by um, whatever is coming up on your screen or on your phone, um, that to deliberately take a moment and say, what's going on in here 
is actually very informative and um, something that I've, I feel like I've really benefited from taking that moment several times a day to do that. And the research bears that. I mean, you talk about in the book research that has stock traders who are more in tune with their body making better stock decision trades. Yes. So see, this can pay off for people <laughs> in big ways, right? Right. Um, I want to also just move to kind of the notion of movement with our bodies mm -hmm. and how that can sometimes help us think. Um, I was talking to Annie earlier um, and felt like I checked a couple of boxes because I actually listened to her book on audio while I was out in nature. So I checked two boxes of things <laughs> that help our, our minds absorb. But the notion of walking, um, people has anybody here ever done like a walking treadmill desk? Um, folks have done that with some success. Mm -hmm. Why is that movement not overexerting ourselves right. because you point out you can't necessarily think as you're going, you know, six miles an hour in a treadmill, right. but walking at a comfortable pace is a way to help absorb information. Yeah. Yeah. This was a surprise to me also yeah. because I was uh, a, um, a devo devotee of the idea that you want to get something done, you put your butt in the chair mm -hmm. and you keep it there until it's done. Right. I mean, that's how you meet deadlines, right. that's, how you, that's how you get hard work done. Um, and that's reflective of a, a, a real dichotomy in our culture, which separates mind and body, tends to elevate mind um, uh, as, as the kind of place where all the uh, intellectual good stuff happens and the body is this kind of grubby animal thing down here that we can push aside. Um, and, and that's reflected in the way that we often exclude movement from thinking. Again, like you, if you, if you want to get something done, that means you sit still in, uh, in a chair until it's done. But in fact, the human organism evolved to be thinking and moving at the same time. If you think about the kind of uh, activities that our, uh, our uh, ancient forebears kind of engaged in, um, a lot of those activities like foraging or hunting were cognitively complex, mentally complex, and physically complex and demanding. They were, um, we were moving and thinking at the same time. And, and we actually still, to this day, we still have bodies and brains that are the same as our, effectively the same as our Stone Age ancestors. So um, although we in our modern world tend to think, well, I'll work while sitting still all day. And then after work, I'll go to the gym, you know, or with children, you think, uh, we tell them to go out and run around and play at, at recess. But then when you come inside and sit down, you've got to, you know, sit still at your desk. Actually, we want to be thinking of ways to integrate movement and thinking. Um, a, a walking treadmill desk, like yeah. Betsy mentioned, is a great way to do that. Um, another way is to incorporate uh, sessions of movement into our into our day instead of sort of saving them all for the the end of the day or for the weekend, mm -hmm. I actually, um, I'm on, uh, I'm in so many meetings, so many Zoom meetings um, throughout the day that uh, it can be hard to fit in even a walk or something right. like that. So I, I will admit this, I have brief, I take brief dance breaks yeah. where I will, if I have just five minutes bef between meetings, I will turn on music and I will dance around and it's actually incredibly invigorating. Yeah. I mean, it kind of reminds you that you have a body and that you are more than this, you know, head in a box on a screen. And I feel like we've gotten so over reliant on Zoom. Sometimes there's meetings that don't need to be on Zoom. You can do on the phone and you can actually yes. walk while you're doing that. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. You don't have yes. to be looking at that computer screen. But you right. mentioned recess. And I think when we're thinking about kids, too. Um, anybody that's a parent of small children knows that, you know, recess time has been just cut back, cut back, yes. cut back in a lot of schools. And what yes. you're saying is that we need kids out there moving. It helps them learn. Absolutely. Yes. And um, there is research that suggests that um, our get, getting for ch children and adults, getting active like that, it actually improves our, our ability to think about complex problems. It improves our ability to remember to focus, to concentrate, and that effect can last for a couple hours after we've been physically active. So if we're if we are sitting still all day, or we're expecting our kids to sit still all day, we're actually kind of cheating them and our and ourselves out of 
um, this greater brain power that we could be granting them. Right. And another aspect of sort of our body that Annie talks about in the book, which she is, by the way, doing extremely well sitting in here and talking to you, because as you might have noticed, she does a lot of gestures with her hands. And you talk about in the book how gesturing while you're talking or teaching, or if you're learning something, watching somebody use their hands can be a really helpful way to get someone to absorb the information. Yes. And, and you're doing that perfectly. Have you always been a gesture or are you just practicing your own I'm, advice? I'm very flattered to hear you say that, Betsy, because I know you do media training. You probably are, are telling people it's good to, to do gesture. that. Right? I, I, um, I have always been a gesture. So I was very glad to, to um, run across this research that suggests that not only, as Betsy says, does gesturing help other people absorb what you're saying. And research suggests that um, people pay attention to, remember, understand what you're saying better. The, the stuff that you say when accompanied with gesture rather than stuff that you know you say with, with mm -hmm. no gesture. Um, not only that, gesture helps you, you. the gesture, to think more clearly and express yourself more um, eloquently. Um, and that's because uh, to come up with something to, to be, you know, improvising in a sense, what you're going to say as, as we as we are every moment of every day is actually quite um, challenging. And research suggests that people gesture more when they're trying to figure something out than when they are relaying something that they already fully understand. And the reason that we we gesture more when we're really trying to grasp something is that um, as I say, um, to, to, to work through something verbally is, is quite demanding. And so we offload some of that work onto our hands. And although I think we, we might imagine that gesturing, if we think about gesturing at all, we might think of it as maybe this kind of, you know, slightly clumsy add on to what really matters, which is, you know, your verbal expression, actually gestures uh, research has found that they are a few milliseconds ahead of what you say mm -hmm. verbally. So one reason the gesture helps us speak more eloquently is that we're actually kind of bootstrapping ourselves. We're reading off, we can read off our own hands um, what, what we're trying to say before the words come to us. I will also say just anecdotally, I think it helps with and I come across this in media training with people that have verbal crutches that say, ah, uh, or, you know, a lot of the time it's because our minds and our mouths are working at different speeds mm -hmm. and our mouth is trying to, you know, keep up right. and wait for our mind. And so even just gesturing can take the place in a lot of cases. If you have a tendency to do ums and uhs a lot when you're public speaking, it could probably help with that as well. I, I think it helps evoke for yourself, Self. what you're yes. trying to say. And exactly. I bet it also gives a clue to your listener of where you're going yes. while you're trying to get yeah. the, the right words together. I remember talking to um, uh, a politician who was, um, well, I'll just say who it was, it's not a big secret, uh, Elizabeth <laughs> Warren, when she was ran, running for president. And she was about to give a big speech and she was talking just backstage about how she uses gestures in the course of the speech to illustrate various components. If she's talking about a prices increasing, she'll use her hmm. hands. Like, and she does it very deliberately hmm. to help the audience connect with that's, what she was. In, and it's a very deliberate, a deliberate thing that she, that she does. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 One, one of the um, pieces of practical advice that I offer in the book is to if you're if you are giving a speech to practice your gestures just like you would practice your words i think a lot of us leave that to chance yes it sounds like elizabeth warren actually is is quite intentional about how she yeah and gesture. you mentioned in the book too about about that with actors learning their lines yes. and the positioning of where they are on a stage can help them in many cases some actors will say i'm not even going to learn my lines until i can stage it out because yes. it helps them figure out what their next line is going to be. Exactly. It's kind of like gesture is like a coat tree, I think, of it. And then you hang the, the words on it. And if you if you don't have that structure in place of your movement, then the words are going to um, they're going to escape you. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you it's really amazing to me how actors are able to memorize incredible pages right? and pages of script and remember them. And the reason is, is that they are tying those words to physical movements, which um, become part of their memory. Yeah. 
It's incredible. Mm. So th that sort of encapsulates kind of the body component in the book. And then you move on to sort of spaces. And to me, it was fascinating to think about nature. I mean, I think we always think of, oh, if we can look at a beautiful tree, that's helpful. But mm -hmm. there's science behind yeah. the fact that this is a good, healthy thing for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that goes back again to our evolutionary history, um, you know, that we actually, as human beings, we evolved in the outdoors. Like right. this world where we're inside almost all the time is, evolutionarily speaking, very recent. Um, so our, our senses, our, our brains evolved in the outdoors. And it's still the case, I mean, we can look at this beautiful greenery out here, that um, the kind of information, the kind of stimuli that is in the outdoors is really easy for our brains to process. It's we, we process it effortlessly, unlike the kind of very hard edge directed attention that we have to pay to, you know, a computer screen right. or to a page of, um, of written text. When we go outside, you know, I think we a, a lot of us feel that way. We go outside, it's kind of like we can relax because all the information streaming in is actually so easy, effortless, and pleasant to process. And that gives our attention a break. There's actually uh, a whole body of research called attention restoration, um, the att attention restoration effect, which is that when we go outside, we're effectively sort of filling up our attentional tank. Um, we're we're refreshing that resource that gets drained when we're working so hard in our offices or in our classrooms. And so I think, you know, we think so much about the um, demand side of attention, like w what's pulling on our attention. We Putting don't think, down our phones. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? But we don't think so much of this, about the supply of yeah. our attention. Where's that coming from? Yeah. We actually want to periodically refresh that supply and going outside is the best way to do that. And I loved in the book, you mentioned um, a company that um, was doing an app. And I think there's maybe a couple of them now, depending yes. on the city, but similar to Waze, where you would put in your directions on how to get there. If you live in a, a walkable city, you could put in where you're going and it will tell you the route to take that you will encounter more nature the along the greenest, way. The, the greenest, greenest route. route. Yes. I love this. Yes, not, not the I, past. I looked to see if they the had greenest. one for New Orleans and they don't. <laughs> <laughs> but what a cool thing. And what a cool idea. Yeah, because when we, you know, there's kind of biases built into our technology and this is one of them that our, our technology, our, our ways and Google, Google Maps and all that, they're looking to give us the fastest way to get somewhere. But what if we were put another value in place of fast? We put the value on, well, how is this walk going to feel for me? How am I going to refresh my attention on this walk? And so a, a route that takes you past a lot more greenery, past birdsong, you know, all the um, stimuli that we encounter in, um, in nature is going to give you a whole different kind of experience. That's neat. And then now we can't always be in nature. So you also talk about kind of built spaces mm -hmm. and how we can think about constructing our own work environment, or our own environment to be more receptive. Uh, you talk about there's some studies that talk about people that can personalize components in their office that have meaningful things to them again, helps people think better rather than working in a sterile kind of environment. Right? Yes, yes, yes. And I think this is of importance to those of us who uh, work, a lot of us work at home now, right. or we have a hybrid arrangement where we work sometimes at home, sometimes in the office. And when you think about it, um, we have so many identities, you know, where we may be parents, we may be, um, we're citizens, we're friends, we're, you know, we're workers, all of those things. And when we're in a certain place, the cues that we see around us kind of prime one identity or another. And I think this is one of the reasons why working at home can be challenging is that I, I know I always am, you know, thinking about, well, what should I put in that load of laundry? Right. Or like, is that is the refrigerator calling to me? Because, you know, the, a home is, is a repository of so many different kinds of um, facets of our identity. So one thing that has helped me is um, thinking about what researchers call evocative objects, um, which are objects that kind of signal to you something about a particular identity that you want to be um, activating in, in that space. And they talk, researchers talk about two different kinds of, of objects. One would be cues of identity mm -hmm. that remind you of who you are in that space. Um, you know, for me, that might be um, previous articles that I've written or um, 
you know, uh, a, a memorabilia. Um, actually, I was going to say in the, the other category is uh, cues of belonging. Um, so that would signal something to you about a value group to which you belong. Or so like that, pictures of your kids. Pictures, or, yeah. Well, although those are that's a, maybe those a are distraction. Like, <laughs> I, memorabilia of like you know my my um, my the journalism school I went to or the fel mm -hmm. a fellowship that mm -hmm. um, that uh, with a think tank that I've been affiliated with for a long time. That kind of remind me, put me in the mode prime, as psychologists would say, a certain identity rather than oh, the identity of mom. Yes, or, okay, yeah. that makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And you also talk about, and I'm guilty of this too, of you're working on something, you're stressed, you're going to take a break, and oh, what are you going to do? Oh, you're going to check Facebook. You're going to sit, go from one act, one computer activity to another, and you right. point out that. That is not a good break for your mind. That's not a good break. No. And it feels different. You know, you think, well, yeah, now yeah. I'm scrolling. Yeah, exactly. The news yeah. Or, you know, but actually in terms of your attention and, and what's being asked of your brain, it's very similar. Yeah. So then you come back to and you're not your refreshed. computer screen now feeling, if anything, looking after looking at the news kind of depleted um, when really, um, you know, a five minute burst of movement or a five minute, um, you know, brief walk outside or, or connecting with another person in a face-to-face uh, a -face way or a voice-to-voice -voice way yeah. would be a lot more refreshing. Yeah. And you also talk about sort of this notion of space, of the thinking within the space of ideas right. and how like our presence and where we are is very natural to us. I don't know if anybody, this happens to me all the time. If I'm re-listening and you mentioned this in the book and I was like this happens all the time to me if you're re-listening to a podcast or mm -hmm. re-listening to an audiobook your mind will immediately tell you where you were when you first heard a particular passage it's and that wild, always right? freaks me out yeah. every time that happens yeah. but it happens all the time yes. why is that why is that yeah I think so again going back to our evolutionary history it was actually really important for us to remember where things happen, yeah. either good things like, okay, this is a place for me to find food or water or bad things like this is a place of danger. I've got to remember where this happened. And so our minds automatically, and this is not something we're doing consciously, yeah. um, tags uh, uh, experiences yeah. with, with the location where they happen. So I have that experience all the time, Betsy, <laughs> that I'm playing a song yeah. or a, or an audio or a podcast and I, and I, Almost, uh, you know, if you're driving, you can think, oh, I was going over this bridge, right, or I was turning right, this corner, right. where you could never remember that bridge or that corner ever again, but the words just sync up with it. Right, in your right. Head. Which suggests how important place exactly. is to, um, to our thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And you write about also this notion of kind of offloading in a physical space. And you write about one of my favorite authors, Robert Caro, yes. um, who, of course, has done, you know, this long series of books on LBJ. Um, I think he's on his fourth or fifth volume now and like mm -hmm. thousands of pages of research. And he has this wall and I've seen documentaries about mm -hmm. it where he will sketch out, you know, on this long wall, various components of the book. Yes. And you talk about, did you use any of those similar techniques? Because you have... I mean, you have to have at least a thousand references to various pieces of research in your book. Yeah, like, yeah, did yeah, you? Is yeah. your wall like covered with sticky notes yeah, too? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would never compare myself to Robert Caro, but I do. Um, I, 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 I too love that he has his whole book from start to finish planned out. Yeah. Before he begins, and he doesn't use a computer either. I mean, yeah, he just uses a typewriter. That's but cool. um, what's so interesting about that is that. You know, our culture really values doing things in your head. Like we admire people who can do complex calculations or, or um, you know, chess players who can work out many, many moves in advance in their heads. But it turns out that actually it's often more efficient and effective to get ideas and information out of your head and spread it out on physical space. And that's what Robert Caro does and what, what I have learned to do as well. Because as you say, there's a lot of research in my book and it, did, it was hugely helpful to have the big bulletin board that I have in yeah. my office. And I'm, I'm a, a profligate user of, of post-it notes. I lo really love post-it notes because you can move them around. And what uh, I came to understand through the research that I did for the book is that Again, from an evolutionary point of view, our brains aren't really that well suited to dealing with concepts, with abstractions. 
what our brains really evolved to do is manipulate physical objects and move through a three-dimensional space. So the more that we can make ideas and information like physical objects that we can move around or like a landscape that we can navigate through the way Robert Caro apparently will, you know, kind of walk up and down this very long um, bulletin board that he has set up and kind of zoom in, zoom out in a physical way, not zooming on your computer, but, you know, physically kind of navigating through the space that allows us to bring all these embodied resources that make thinking easier and right. more effective instead of just trying to do it all up here. It's like the episodes of like Homeland where she's got like the crime scene and the connections <laughs> right. all spilled out right. and the pictures right. and like there's science behind it. It's, it's right. It's yeah. really effective to do that. So the last section of your book also that deals with sort of um, the notion of, of people and of, um, you call it socially distributed cognition, thinking mm -hmm. with relationships. Yes. And one of the things you start to talk about is kind of thinking with experts. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about why that's an important component of how. Yeah. We yeah. So. As I mentioned earlier, this book really was rooted originally in the science of, of learning. Yeah. So it, it struck me as I did, re did the research on this part of the book that all of our uh, educational systems, our workplace training systems are based on this very, uh, what seems like a, a, a you know, fundamental aspect of, of learning, which is that we have experts teaching novices, right? We have experts, masters who teach beginners. Um, and that has a built-in problem, which is that experts, by virtue of being experts, think differently mm. from novices. They have automated so much of what at first was a conscious and deliberate kind of um, application of, of knowledge. Uh, and we, we all know that when we, if we started to learn something, at first, it's very effortful. You know, we have to think about every step and we often get it wrong. And um, But as we become more proficient, our brains uh, automate that those steps and we don't even think about, think about them anymore, which is, is great because then we're able to do it fluently, easily, without thinking. But that creates a problem for when that expert is teaching a novice because they literally no longer have access hmm. to all those things that um, a novice really needs to learn step by step by step. So how do you get around this? It's, you know, psychologists call it uh, the curse of knowledge um, because once you, you have uh, taken on this knowledge as, a, as an expert, you no longer have access to it in a way that allows you to explain it to a novice. So some ways of getting around that might be to break down what you do, to really consciously look at what you do, if, if you are in a position of teaching uh, a beginner, to break it down into steps and smaller steps and even micro steps. Um, you can remind yourself of what it was like to be a beginner. There's a wonderful experiment in which um, guitar teachers were asked to play their guitar with their non-dominant hand and then to give a lesson to a beginner. And the um, guitar teachers who had just had that experience ah. of being, you know, kind of clumsy and, and um, not masterful were better able to teach their, their students. The students learned more because the uh, expert was put back in what, you know, Zen practitioners call beginner's mind. They, they remembered what it was like to be a beginner and what a beginner needs to know uh, that has become almost invisible to the to the expert. Interesting. Um, I will we'll note the time, and we have um, about 11 minutes left, so, and we're going to take some questions in about one minute. So if you do have a question, we have two microphones, one over here and one over here. So if you um, have a question, please start to line up for that, and we will um, we'll do that in just a minute. But I also wanted to ask you, because you, you also write about the importance of peers and discussion and having constructive arguments yes. can also be a way to learn. And you, there's studies behind that as well. Yes. And constructive is constructive. an important word. Yeah. I mean, you cover <laughs> exactly. politics, so yeah. you know about arguments. 
yes, I mean, this to me is another kind of bias in our culture that we want to take another look at because we tend, to, just as we tend to separate mind and body uh, in ways that are unhelpful, we tend to separate our social selves from our intellectual, mental, academic selves. You know, again, like with kids, we expect them to mix it up on the playground or during lunchtime and chat with their friends. But then when you come back into the classroom, you've got to, you know, don't look at your neighbor. Don't, right. don't talk to your neighbor. Just, you know, you're kind of, you're in your own little pod. Um, and the same with us in workplaces. You know, we have happy hours after work, but then when you're at work, you're supposed to be getting your work done. And the reason that's a problem is that human beings are so fundamentally social. We really think and learn in social ways. And our social brains, which are so powerful, they don't turn off when we enter a classroom or a workplace. So what we really want to be thinking about is how do we leverage or harness the social brain in the service of thinking and learning. And one, one way to do that is to um, turn an episode of learning or thinking into a constructive debate or argument that activates all these social capacities we have that are so powerful, or teaching another someone who is um, maybe someone who's close to you in, in ability, but maybe one step behind. That's that kind of peer-to-peer -peer teaching tends to be really, really effective. It actually gets around the um, curse of knowledge that we were talking about because uh, someone who's, who's just recently been a novice can really be in touch with what it's like to be a beginner. And then finally, telling stories, which I know Betsy is going to be <laughs> an expert at and, and very familiar it with the power of that. Things. Yes, you have a story to go along with something. It's it really so much convey. more memorable, right, yes, than just sure. sort of a download of information. Exactly, exactly. All right, well, we have some questions. Let me start here, and then I'll go over there. Can you introduce yourself as well, please? Sure. Hello? Is this working? We got you. Okay. Hi, my name is Andrew Kim. Hi. I actually want to apologize ahead of time because I actually don't have a question, but I do have uh, two things that I wanted to add um, from my own personal experience, which is that number one, um, you mentioned the, taking the five minutes to uh, essentially take a dance break. Yeah. I've noticed for myself that I get uh, some of my best thinking done when I pace around. Uh, mm. uh, and so that's probably just enough. I think just uh, some minimal level of uh, physical exercise, or not exercise, but physical activity uh, definitely helps with the um, the mental uh, jump. The second thing I noticed um, also is that I'm currently in the uh, high school education space and mm -hmm. um, something that I have mastery in that the students do not. And I've realized that when I um, try to uh, essentially pack as much of knowledge that I know into them, um, it doesn't quite um, mm -hmm. go as well. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I do break down all the little things into small steps, mm -hmm. that's when um, the learning um, happens best. And so... Um, just wanted to uh, add to and thank you for essentially confirming what I've come across in real life. <laughs> That's always great. Nice, right? Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Mayer here from St. Louis. Uh, so, it, well, first of all, my, my comment is that it seems like we should have all been sort of walking around the room. Exactly. We're sharing this exactly. information. <laughs> We're doing it all wrong by sitting still. Right. But my question was, I was wondering if you might comment on how your research shifts, if it does, for people who have neurodiverse thinking hmm. yes. approaches? Yes, yes. That's a great question. Thank you, Sarah. One thing I noticed um, when I was doing the research for the book and then after it came out, when I heard from people who had read it, was that people who are neuro neurodivergent, for example, people have dyslexia, these are the champions of thinking outside the brain, of, um, of, the, of utilizing the extended mind in part because they, they had to find their way to um, sort of outside the box approaches because perhaps the conventional ways didn't work so well for them. So um, people who have dyslexia, that's, that's something I'm particularly interested in because there's, there's dyslexia in my family, but they're often incredibly resourceful and ingenious in terms of coming up with strategies that involve movement or that involve um, What's, what's called cognitive offloading, which is this getting ideas and information out of your head onto physical uh, uh, space, which might be flashcards or, or post-it notes or what have you, or um, really utilizing other people. I I've heard stories about Richard Branson, who is the, um, you know, the founder of Virgin Atlantic, and how he, um, or, or um, 
well, I'm forgetting his name, but the very famous uh, lawyer who's, um, who's dyslexic, and they rely on um, social interactions, people telling them what they need to know rather than reading. Um, so in a way, I think we have so much to learn from people who are neurodivergent because they've, they've had to find their, ways, their way to these kinds of alternative strategies, but really all of us could be utilizing them and sort of looking to them as, as models. That's great. Okay, we'll go over here. Hello, my name is Lena Alexeva. So the speaker before me said that they taught um, in a high school curriculum. Well, I'm a high school student mm -hmm. and um, I just have a quick question. So being a high schooler, uh, especially at a STEM school, that means that we sit at a desk for eight hours and because of like the amount of APs and classwork that we have to do, um, that takes up like a lot of sitting space. So being so exhausted from the amount of schoolwork that you're doing, how would I have the ability to really move my body more, you know, when I'm like being forced to like consume all this type of like media and being on my Chromebook mm -hmm. all day? Great question. Yeah. That is a great question. Um, and uh, I have two sons, actually, who are in high school. So this is something I think about a lot. Um, I think, of course, we're limited in terms of what we can do in school, although it might be a possible. Perhaps you could think about asking your teacher, you know, um, I really think better when I move. I wonder if I could, you know, in a way that doesn't disturb other students, kind of like, um, stand and stretch or walk around to the back of the room. And in fact, there is a movement in education called activity permissive classrooms, where the idea is that students should be able to sit or move or stand in whatever way is most helpful for them. Again, not disrupting or distracting other students, but acknowledging that we're really made to move. Um, but I think probably where these this approach could be implemented is in your own study time, that you could think about Instead of, you know, in order to study for this test, I need to sit at this desk, not talk to anybody, you know, close the door, uh, shut myself in. Actually, there's so many other resources I could be pulling into my study time here. I could be moving my body. I could be tuning into what's going on inside my body. I could be gesturing. I could be... Um, Sitting out under a beautiful tree. Sitting out under a beautiful tree, right, like going outside, restoring and refreshing your attention by going outside. Um, you could be putting those ideas and thoughts on a big um, whiteboard, um, or you could be um, engaging in, in a social interaction, like teaching, um, taking turns teaching or tutoring um, someone else in your, in your class. I mean, one thing that I... I urge my kids to remember when they are, uh, I, I find that when they're under stress, you know, they have a test coming up, they default to that kind of um, non-extended mind. You know, I just have to Lock bear down. down and yes. Yeah. Um, and that's actually the moment when you want to open it up and say, what are some other outside the brain resources I could be taking advantage of here? And I think actually that helps with the stress also, yeah. um, you know, the movement and the being outside, it's really good for the stress. Good advice. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Anthony Carey. Um, I'm actually a student here at Tulane and kind of in tandem to your response. Can you speak up a notch? Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks, um, in tandem to your previous response, I was just wondering, um, I love that you mentioned the attention restoration theory. Uh -huh. mind flank, I, my mind went right to the pots of green uh, flanking either side of sides of the stage, but I was wondering if you have any insights towards this movement um, of ecology and sustainability within workspaces or even in urban planning and how that has mm -hmm. changed um, not only innovation, but the way that societies interact with each other, both in work and outside of work. Yes. So, so you mean bringing in green spaces into buildings, incorporating that mm -hmm. intentionally into, into buildings and yes. space, uh, urban spaces? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, that's a wonderful movement and long overdue. You know, there's um, this idea, which some of you may have heard of, no, called biophilia, which is this idea that human beings are, you know, we're so con we're, uh, fundamentally connected to nature. We love nature. We get so much from nature. And yet so many of our buildings and our cities cut us off from this really vital resource. And perhaps that is part of what has allowed us to treat the natural world you know, so poorly. And that's why we're in the situation we're in today. But if we can bring nature back into our the settings that we all 
um, inhabit every day, I think that we'll be strengthening that, that connection. I think it's, it's a wonderful development. All right, if we have a 10 second question, we yeah. can get to you. Julie Kelly in Rye, New York, you kind of answered this, but I was asking if you're seeing any more evidence in K through 12 education that they're embracing these ideas. And I would tell you, get your teacher and your principal a copy of the book. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, um, you know, I, I, that's a great question. I have seen a lot of movement in terms of social emotional learning. So that's the, the relationships part. Um, I do see more, uh, this was um, accelerated by the pandemic, more bringing of nature into uh, education. And just now I'm beginning to see, just lately I'm beginning to see more of the embodied cognition making an impact in education that um, we're realizing that kids have bodies too, not just brains and we're teaching, we need to be teaching their bodies as well as their brains. Well, please join me in thanking Annie. Uh, terrific book, congratulations. Thank you all for being here.